I'm Dave Stouffer, reading episode number six from the book, The Reverend Mr. J.C., When Appearances Are Not Enough, written by yours truly. We're calling our program J.C.'s World. In the last reading, J.C. broke down some mental walls and admitted he needed to learn more about the Christian faith that he professed. He's already learned much about giving himself through physical work, and now he takes that to the next level. One Sunday afternoon toward the end of February, J.C. had been invited to the Gillette House in Van Buren. He was sitting talking with Ed in the living room before dinner, and the conversation had slowed. There were some interesting conversations in the Gillette House. There were words hanging unsaid in the air all the time. The Gillettes and Ruth and even Jill seemed to have signed a pact to follow the bishop's injunction to the letter not to talk about what J.C. did in Provincetown. At first, J.C. had trouble understanding that, and after a while it was okay. Because he was a little embarrassed about some of the things he did in Provincetown in the name of ministry. He really wanted to tell someone about the confirmation class. How excited he was that the kids were asking good questions and learning and that he was learning too, but no one asked. And he didn't want to sound like he was bragging. During this particular awkward silence, J.C. noticed some colorful catalogs on the table, picked one up and saw it was a seed catalog from the Earl May Company. I see you've got several of these, Ed. I guess I didn't remember that Marianne was a gardener. Well, she's not so much a gardener, but she kind of likes to put in some flowers every year. Ruth used to love to work in the garden. J.C. said, yes, I remember. He didn't. If Ruth planted anything at the parsonage where they lived, he was too wrapped up in his own world to see. Uh, Ed, do you have an extra one of these? Ha! Ah, you're going to do some gardening, J.C.? I can't see you getting your hands dirty that much. If only you knew, thought J.C. Well, um, Pastor James, he made a passing mention of the big lawn out behind the church and maybe we could do a little something out there. Take it with you, J.C. It was Monday afternoon before J.C. could back James into a corner and ask for some time. Meantime, J.C. had been through the Earl May catalog and had dog-eared pages and actually marked in it and then when he was shocked, when he realized what he had done. James, you were talking about that field in the back of the church, and just sitting there, and I know it's too big for just what you and I would eat alone, but we wouldn't have to plow it all up, and Everett Harris has got a buddy who could plow up whatever we need. Slow down, John. Are you talking about a garden here? Yeah, look, and J.C. held up the catalog. I'll be darned, said James. An Earl May catalog. Haven't seen one of those in years. Where did you get it? So J.C. told him the story. And, and James, I love sweet corn. I thought we could have a couple of rolls of sweet corn and maybe some peas. James added tomatoes, nothing like a fresh homegrown tomatoes and asparagus. Do you like asparagus, John? I really never have cared much for asparagus, James. Well, you've never had it any the way I cook it. And talking about tomatoes, have you ever had fried green tomatoes, John? John couldn't even understand what they were, but did not want to throw cold water on James' enthusiasm. Never had them, but I'll bet they're good. Oh, they're better than good. And radishes! They each made a list of what they'd like to see in the garden. Both had two pretty full pieces of paper by the time they got back together. James, I think we need to be realistic about how many things we're going to plant. J.C. could envision blood, sweat, and tears and time running into the ground between the rows of plants. You're right, John, a garden's like a child. It's a whole lot of fun making one, but during that fun you forget about what a commitment it is to watch it grow and take care of it. They laughed together, then each disappeared to shorten their lists. James located a couple of beat-up hoes and an old-fashioned high-wheel cultivator to dig up weeds. This is about all we got for equipment, John. The home center was putting out a whole section for gardening in the spring. I'll bet we can get whatever else we need there. So after supper, they sat down with the catalog and their lists, 
and using their very best judgment, oft times against the thought of how something would taste, they picked out the seeds to plant in the garden. James, do you like marigolds? J.C. asked. Uh, marigolds, kind of uh, orange and black? Yeah, that's them. Well, I guess I do. Why do you ask? Well, it says in the catalog, if you plant them close to your garden, that the scent of the marigolds keeps some pests off your plants. Besides that, I think they'd be kind of pretty. Let's do her, said James. J.C. filled out the order form, and the next morning, hand carried an envelope with the order form and a check for the total. They were going to keep track of expenses and split them half and half down to the post office, where he personally handed the letter to Tom Shellman, the window clerk, saying, Take good care of this one, Tom, and I'll have you some fresh sweet corn. Tom looked at the address on the envelope, laughed, and said, Where are you going to plant this garden, Pastor? Well, Pastor James and I are going to put it in that big field behind the church. The hell you say, Pastor? Oh, pardon my French. Uh, me and Candace was talking the other day about having a garden, but ever since they built that new house next door to us, we don't have any room. I'll tell you what, Tom. J.C. had an idea, thought he could make a decision without running it past James. That church lot is awful big space. I don't see at all why you and Candace can't have two or three rows. James and I are going to have it all plowed up. We'll just have a plow for a little extra. But you folks would have to do the planting and the weeding and keeping it up. Is that okay? You bet it's okay, Reverend. Thank you. When J.C. came back to the parsonage and ran into James, he told him about the conversation. John, do you know what you did? J.C.'s stomach flip-flopped. James, I don't, I don't understand how loaning out a little ground to a couple of nice people to have some garden space is wrong. It seems like the kind of thing you're doing all the time. What's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it, John. I think it's a wonderful thing. You did know that Tom and Candace Shellman are Catholics, didn't you? Well, yeah. What's that got to do with it? It looked for a moment like James was going to reach out and pat John on the head. It doesn't have anything to do with anything, John. We are all a community of believers, some who need help believing, but we're all one community. James put his arm around J.C.'s shoulders. You're coming along, John. You're coming along. A couple of weeks went by with both men going to the mailbox at least once a day, waiting for the package from the Earl May Seed Company. In the meantime, Everett Harris's buddy, Gomer, had decreed, and with a level of knowledge that men like him always seemed to have, that the end of March was as good a time as any to get that patch plowed. The patch of ground behind the church actually was two house lots. The previous owners of the church had bought the lots for possible expansion and had never used them. In the meantime, they were the site of pickup baseball, softball, and football games, and from time to time a good place for the inconsiderate and careless to throw trash. James and J.C. went to clean off a portion of it for their use. It felt so good to be outside again that they cleaned off the whole thing. They made a bonfire out of what could be burned, and the bonfire attracted people like moths to a candle flame. Everybody wanted to get outdoors. That's the way it is in the spring. So there were smiling greetings and many questions about the cleaning of the lot. We're going to plant us a garden, said James. Sent away for seeds. Going to have sweet corn. Tomatoes, chimed in J.C. Green beans and asparagus, said James again. J.C. swelling up, and watermelons, too. Everybody standing around the bonfire got pretty excited about that. Gomer showed up a couple days later, putt-putting down the street on his tractor with a three-bottom plow. J.C. went out to greet Gomer and introduce himself. I ain't gonna charge you nothing, he gave J.C. a nudge in the ribs with his elbow. You can just put in a good word with the man upstairs for me. <laughs> he chuckled, climbed back on the tractor and revved the motor. This field over here, eh, Rev? Yes, but not all of it, J.C. tried to explain. But either the motor noise of the tractor was too loud or Gomer only listened to the voices inside his own head, and he plowed up the whole field. It took him two hours, driving back and forth on that gray Ford tractor, Eyes squinted, big grin on his face, looking back from time to time to make sure the furrows were straight. 
J.C. watched for a while, and Gomer waved J.C. close to the tractor. Smell that, young feller, J.C. sniffed. No, I mean smell it. Get your nose wrapped around it. J.C. sniffed three times. He smelled as hard as he could. I smell dirt, earth. Yeah, you do, Rev. But what that smells like is the earth is saying, put your seeds in me. I'm going to bring life. This is good ground. You're going to grow some fine crops in here. I love the smell of new plowed dirt. And he put the four tractor back in gear and finished plowing the field. J.C. hadn't been much impressed with Gomer. He usually didn't know what to do with people who didn't dress neat and tidy, didn't think neat and tidy, didn't speak neat and tidy. But today, J.C. started thinking about what Gomer had said, not what Gomer had looked like. The Reverend Mr. J.C. knelt down in the dirt, and he scooped up a couple of handfuls of that dirt. Instead of noticing that the knees of his pants were dirty, and there was dirt under the edges of his fingernails, he noticed the earthy aroma of the dirt and almost dropped it because a little earthworm came wriggling out. He'd heard a long time ago that earthworms were good for the soil. He put the soil back on the ground and stayed on his knees. It was quiet. He wasn't thinking about whether he was alone or out of sight. As a matter of fact, he wasn't thinking at all. He was feeling. He could hear a little breeze blowing. At the edge of the field, he could see the first little green sprouts poking out of the thatch of fall and winter. He could almost hear them growing. As a matter of fact, he imagined that he could. His mind gave the little green growing things personalities, and he imagined their happiness coming out of the ground after a long, hard, cold, snowy winter to feel the breeze and the warmth of the sun. He remembered the bonfire, the spontaneous coming together of folks from the neighborhood who just seemed to rise up out of the ground like the little plants, happy to be outside after the winter and reaching out for the warmth, yes, of the bonfire, but for the warmth of their neighbors. And J.C. knew that new growth, rebirth, reawakening was a miracle, was God's way of talking in another voice to his people. Winter is over. It's time for a new life, new things, and new awakenings. He didn't know how long he knelt there in the dirt. He didn't ever remember saying Our Father or Dear Lord or any other salutation to invoke prayer as he knew it. But when he got up, he knew that he'd been talking to God and that God had talked to him too. He knew it because he felt that peace. What he used to think of as the peace that passes understanding, and now in his soul, if not quite yet in his brain, J.C. was starting to understand the perfect peace that comes when someone and God are in direct communication. He didn't mention his experience to James. It was too fresh, too precious. And the next day, the package arrived from Earl May Seed Company, I guess if you'd asked either James or J.C. what they had for supper that night, they wouldn't have been able to tell you. Never had food been eaten so fast or clean-up chores been done so quickly. The box was opened and the contents very carefully laid out on the table. Had there ever been such glorious pictures? Had there ever been packages of seeds that rattled so promisingly? They sat, talked, planned till bedtime. They needed some stakes to staple the empty seed packages to to place at the ends and the middles of the rows so they could tell where different plants were. Oh, and they needed string, heavy string, and more stakes so they could lay out the rows perfectly straight. This was not going to be a junkyard of a garden. Saturday morning. It was a little chilly. After all, it was just the 1st of April. They had thought perhaps they were pushing it a little bit, but Gomer had opined he thought it would be okay. So in hooded sweatshirts and jackets, James and J.C. carrying strings and stakes and pegs, thumbtacks, and of course the precious seeds 
along with all the tools, it seems like they had both gone to the home center at different times and had assembled enough tools for a large group to garden with, and they started to plant. Planting doesn't happen quickly, particularly when you have two people working at it who really want to do it right, but who are both so excited that they keep making little miscalculations in measurements and stake hammering, so it took a while to get the string straight. The car pulled up to the curb and Tom and Candace Shellman got out. Tom introduced James and J.C. to Candace. Reverend Wesley, did you mean what you said about us having a couple of rows to plant things in? I sure did. Anytime you're ready. Tom went back to his vehicle and started pulling from its trunk the same kinds of things that James and J.C. had already accumulated by their path. Soon Tom and Candace were making the same calculations, discussing earnestly how much one of the rows should be sweet corn and how much should be beans. The field covered an acre and a half. That's a lot of ground. J.C. and James had discovered that even with all the things they wanted to plant and using the spacing recommended on the seed envelopes, they weren't using as much ground as they thought they would. The Shellmans too had found that even though they'd been conservative, Considering that it was borrowed space, they were getting their seeds planted in a smaller area than they thought. You just don't do something without a bunch of looky-loos. All morning long, there had been a series of older gentlemen with nothing better to do than supervise and offer suggestions, and sometimes even get in the way. But now, other folks from the neighborhood, some on foot, some even driving cars, who had mysteriously heard about the Trinity preachers planting a garden, came to see for themselves. James and J.C., because they had studied the seed catalog, and because Gomer had imparted so much of his rich knowledge to J.C., had most of the answers to the questions people were asking as they made conversation. But they had no answer as several people wistfully inquired about what they were going to do with the rest of the plot of space. J.C. said, James, come over here for a minute, please. What would be wrong with letting some of the rest of these people plant some things here in the patch? We could make the same rule that we did for the shamans, that they'd have to take care of it, weed it, and so forth. We've got water coming out of the back of the church. We can water the whole thing. I think, I think other people would like to have fresh produce as much as we do. What do you think, James? J.C. couldn't see through James' eyes into his mind. Otherwise, he would have seen James dancing a jig, his arms straight up in the air like an athlete who has won a race. What J.C. did hear was James saying, That's a good idea, John. I'm glad you thought of it. I'm not sure it would have occurred to me. You go ahead, John, and see who wants to do it. And, John, do you think you could handle the rest of this by yourself? I'm feeling a little tired. I think maybe I'll go back to the parsonage. Sure, James. Are you okay? Do you need help? Uh, no, thanks, John. I'm just fine. You just wore me out. You're getting to be a good worker. So James went off towards the parsonage, and J.C. went back to tell the several people standing in there, It seems to me that we've got more ground here than we've got seeds, and it's all plowed up anyway. So Pastor James and I were wondering whether any of you folks would like to use any of it for garden space. Well, how much would it cost? Nothing. What's a gimme? There's only one rule, said J.C. I knew it, someone said. There would be a rule. You have to practice good gardening, said J.C. You have to keep the weeds down. We're going to get hoes and sprinklers to run from the church. Maybe when we get into a dry spell, we'll set up a schedule for people who would take on watering. That's all. Oh, well. That's not so bad. Well, Reverend, I'd like to do it, but I don't belong to your church. Well, the point of it is to grow produce, not to get new members for the church. After other discussions, several people gave their names and said they'd like to be a part of it. And someone asked, we've got some friends. We know some people well a ways from here. Uh, I don't think they have any more space to have a garden than we do. Could they be a part of this too? I'll tell you what we'll do, said J.C. We pretty much have an idea from today of how much ground it takes to plant what James and I think is plenty for us, 
and what the shamans think is plenty for them. So we'll just kind of break it up into three or four five row segments and we'll just apportion it out. First come, first serve. A couple of people were heard to say, can hardly wait to get started. And JC said, well, if you really feel that way, <laughs> and he laughed. James and I had talked about planting marigolds around the edge of the garden. That's a good idea, said Tom Shulman. Not only are they pretty, they help keep the bugs off. That's right, Tom, but what I didn't realize was how little marigold seeds are and how many are in a package. I think I've got enough packages at least to go along the north and south sides of the field. And you want help getting them in, don't you, Reverend? If you want to get started today, that'd be the thing to do, said J.C. And in ten minutes, there were men and women kneeling all around the outside edges of what was already being referred to as the patch, getting pants and shoes dirty, hands covered with the rich loam, putting seeds in the ground. And J.C. was so excited about the garden project that when he got back to the parsonage, he completely forgot to ask how James was which becomes an important question in the days to come. If you are enjoying these views from JC's World, please join me for the next session. I'm Dave Stover.